<laughs> okay, so to cap off this uh, wonderful set of presentations on the various ways we can use materials within soft robotics and the various sort of functions we want to get out of these materials, uh, we'll hold, uh, you know, what is uh, being charitably described as a soft robotics debate. I think it'll be more of a discussion. Uh, <laughs> Uh, especially since we didn't really set up sides. I think we can all agree that uh, more functional materials are what we're aiming for. I think the question is just how we get there. Uh, so uh, to, to kind of uh, this off, I will, I will you know, put this debate around the question of how should we use functional materials to improve soft robotic capabilities? And to give our panelists a little bit of direction in that, um, I will ask uh, kind of a two-sided question, depending on where you fall on this. So if you don't currently use functional materials uh, in your, uh, uh, as we've sort of seen described uh, uh, in this workshop, uh, in your robots uh, at, at this point, why, what is stopping you from using those functional materials? Or if you are, uh, how do you choose which functional materials to use? Uh, maybe we'll go down the line. Um, sure, yeah, I can start. I, I think you would probably put me in the category of not really sure. using functional <laughs> materials, uh, as I said at the beginning of my talk. Um, I, I think there, there's a few different things. So uh, one may be that, well, both my personal expertise and my students' expertise, most of the students in my lab are mechanical engineers, but ones who really focus on robotics. And so it may be partially the knowledge that we have coming into the work and what we're comfortable with. So I think uh, things might change. Uh, yeah, actually, Renee has a new class at Stanford that is actually connecting soft robotics and materials. And I think if we had more things like that, um, maybe we would start incorporating these ideas more into the research for those of us that come from a classical, more of a classical ME, uh, uh, I guess, robotic side <laughs> background. Um, I would say another thing, and this connects to uh, some conversations we had in the, the you were <laughs> in sure. the panel, I think, uh, on Monday for the actuators workshop, and that's, and that's specs. And yeah. being able to communicate those specs very clearly to materials-related collaborators. So uh, I've had, uh, for example, Zen and Bao's group at Stanford in chemical engineering. They'll come and say, oh, I have this new actuator. It's great. And then I learn, like, it goes like this after, like, five minutes. And, uh, you know, I realized, okay, well, we never communicated to you. That it, it seems awesome. Some of the things that seem obvious to us just don't get communicated. So... I think, yeah, education for my lab yeah. and then us really writing down those specs and communicating them very clearly. Great. Okay. Um, I think Allison had a very good point. Uh, something like a response rate is definitely something that we need to consider. But uh, overall speaking, in terms of uh, functional materials, for example, my lab, we focus on stimuli responsive soft materials. I don't know if it's on. Probably. Let's see. Let's see if the folks back there are surprising them. Okay. Yeah, but this doesn't okay, seem to be amplifying. Yeah, That's yeah, what we're trying to make sure the people in the back of the room can hear as well. All right, great. Um, so, uh, my lab at Stanford, we focus on stimuli responsive soft composites a lot. These are functional materials. And uh, well, we see a lot of papers and demonstrations on using functional materials to show capabilities on an actuation like grippers, artificial muscle. But there's always this question ongoing, whether these materials can provide us with enough or sufficient energy density and power density. This is a very, very challenging point. Um, because if we think about different types of uh, stimuli responsive materials, or we call it functional materials, or thinking about like polymer bursts or polymers, or like liquid crystal elastomer and polymer uh, polymers, all these materials that can deform uh, under uh, external stimuli such as light, and heat, and the different types of fields like the magnetic fields that we are working with. Um, so a key question to us is that uh, um, it's really important to figure out the environment that your material or your robotic system is applying to. 
Um, for us, we are mainly interested in biomedical environment where you don't actually need a huge driving force in terms of like navigating your whole body, complicated systems. Um, so again, back to the challenges that I mentioned is that uh, most of the composite, the soft composites driven by uh, external fields like heat, uh, magnetic fields and all these materials, uh, they are they are limited uh, in terms of providing very large uh, energy density and power density compared to the pneumatically controlled actuators. They are pretty much like a human hand that you can provide the force that we or a human hand can, can provide. So, so yeah, my my point is that uh, it's always important to figure out the environment and then uh, thinking about what material type that we're going to use to develop our um, robot system. Thank you. This is a really great point, Renee, right, on the power density and energy, energy density of these materials. So, for example, for some of the um, the, the works that I just presented for the soft origami inspired uh, robotic systems. Um, the reason that I would say the motivation behind um, the reason why I developed those ones and the idea of combining rigid components together with soft actuators was that as you're scaling down those soft actuators for nail and basic circuit ball applications, they perform not really great with in terms of force output and power densities. And so in the study that um, we have carried out, we were able to demonstrate that there is obviously an advantage in combining those rigid components into those soft micro mm -hmm. actuators, and they have higher power density, higher energy density. However, ideally, yes, you would love to have a material that provides more bending, angles, speed, and all of that. In my experience so far, um, I've been limited obviously by, like I said, the surgical medical applications. You yeah. don't really have uh, that much freedom uh, with those, but it's definitely, it would be great to have materials that, you know, talking more with the material science community and, and the chemist community to have those clear specifications agree upon what, what is needed and that potentially maybe we cannot converge onto a specific solution now, but potentially five years from now. Uh, I think as a material scientist to make this, uh, to, to bridge, to make it be so self-healing materials, I think is a really good thing. And then I started thinking it's a fanciful thing and it isn't actually that useful. The more I've worked on it, the more I've like, actually, if I want to make enduring robots, they're going to get damaged and they have to fix themselves. Um, and so then instead of instead of working on chemistries that are just impossible for other people to work on, we've identified chemistries that I think are easily synthesizable by um, people who aren't chemists. So I think making materials more available um, that are that even if you can't buy them from catalog, you can buy the two things, mix them together, and you can make them and then yeah. at a at a cost that matters. So making it uh, at a cost that's a cost and simplicity that's applicable to roboticists who don't have to have a chemistry degree. Um, I think it's what material scientists have to do and what um, roboticists have to do is better clearly communicate the function requirements to the material scientists. I think that's a great place to lead off into my next question, which was, uh, what, what are the trade-offs, especially from the soft robotic side of things that we need to consider as we're moving into more and more functional materials? Because one that immediately comes to mind for me is cheapness. Uh, you know, uh, uh, soft robotics often say that we've got the cheapest robots, right? Um, but some of that comes from the widely available materials we're working with. And I think the other thing I will bring up is safety. And I, I mean that in the sense of, you know, some of these more exotic materials that we're playing around with have uh, either very high, you know, heat or voltage requirements, or they have some toxicity associated with them. Um, so I think both sides of the, uh, 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 you know, debate or debate, however we want to say it. Uh, but I'd like to hear from both sides, both uh, from the soft roboticists, like, what what of these uh, capabilities of soft robotics should we be thinking about giving up to get more functional soft robots? And from maybe the more material side, are is there an opportunity to bring down some of those risks that might make it a little unsavory to in, in, uh, implement these materials right now? This way. Sure, whichever way, whoever uh, feels the most strongly, uh, feel free. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I think I think um, the idea of the low cost of soft robotics is a red herring. Like, why we don't even have a reason to make 
millions of robots per year, which make the costs uh, an important factor to consider. Um, so um, until that is defined, I don't see why. But in, in fact, our whole my whole lab's premise is that complexity is important, but complexity helps increase cost. Um, and what we're focusing on is the is the additional function you get from soft materials, applying a stress, transmitting that stress over a larger volume, and then sensing that stress propagation and responding to it in terms of the flush. So for us, we've eliminated cost as a, but we do need to, we do need it to be translatable to other people. They have to understand yeah. how to make this on their own. Um, and if they decide it's important, um, then you know you know we don't want to make it ten thousand dollars per gram. But uh, it, you know if there's no if it, it, it seems to me that the, the um, ability for uh, to make ro robots work um, more capable logistically is a pretty important thing. I think you, you with your physiological addressing biomedical is the other. I, we've, we've chosen agronomy, but there's logistical operations, there's medical applications, which is probably the more important one. Um, but all of that requires feeling the environment. And but I'm not, I don't really know the cost is this uh, as important. And maybe there's two costs associated with this one is how much the material actually costs, and then another one is how much do you have to pay an engineer who has specialized knowledge to actually put it together? And you're kind of breaking those apart. You know, Correct. Like you're about. Yeah, we, we think the manufacturing of the thing should not be that expensive, but the material input itself can be more expensive. Um, and, and safety, we think, is one of the is important too. But, yeah. Uh, safety, definitely. I, I, you know, it's a tough question because I don't, in my opinion, I don't want to get rid of any of those kind of sure. soft, soft robots just yet because I think, you know, low cost, for example, to me, low cost is extremely important, even though, for example, for surgical applications, you wouldn't, I mean, the soft, the surgical robots that are currently on the market are so expensive. Right, so maybe yeah. from a surgical roboticist's point of view, I wouldn't mind, you know, my robot to be expensive. But then, the flip side is, well, because those surgical robots are so expensive, they are only available in certain specific, you know, super um, cool cities, and and they're not available everywhere. So imagine that one day you will be having soft surgical robots no cost, disposable, being able to be deployed into low income countries. Yeah. And you didn't you didn't need, you know, the the, the, the problems of cleaning them and sterilizing them afterwards because they're because they are disposable. Now obviously in if maybe what I'm getting at is one capability that I would get rid of with soft robots is the biodegradability maybe mm -hmm. or you know that the fact that they don't have a huge impact on the environment yeah. once they have to be disposed of. But it's motiv motivated by the fact that surgical operations require that level of um, capability anyway, because you can not have a robot that degrades over time. You have to have certain yep. performance, at least for one session or one surgical procedure. So I think, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't really get rid of low cost safety, um, and those can potentially create a lot of advantages in the future, in my opinion. Any other thoughts on the topic? Uh, if you've got. Um, so in terms of the cost, I think, I mean, from my point of view, like from our lab stuff, like lab demonstrations to actual products, it's actually a very long way to go. And the product, the cost of the product actually includes the well, the cost of the technology and the well, the material manufacturing and all that. I think um, so. Uh, to bring it down the cost of the technology associated with the soft robotic um, well, things that we're developing. So it's uh, I think it's a pretty nice thing about soft materials and the soft functional materials is that uh, these uh, technologies are very hands-on and very easy to do. Uh, just uh, everybody can use it and, um, instead of uh, like uh, the conventional uh, rigid robotic systems that are very complicated controlling system that are not very easily to use by everybody or easily adopted by any systems. So I think that's the nice thing about soft robotic system that materials are very well, very widely used and you can have very easy access to those materials and fabrication is also easy. So that brings down the level of uh, uh, difficulty of uh, well, so many people can use it, right? So that's I think a 
great advantage. And in terms of um, our safety, of course, and well, we talk about like uh, medical applications, and those are uh, definitely key things that we need to consider. Yeah, I'll just uh, a couple of brief comments about safety. So I feel like what we should get rid of is any claims of inherent safety. Yeah. I have never had any student in my lab like get injured by a Da Vinci surgical robot or a traditional robot, but we've had a couple pneumatic devices explode <laughs> and send pieces of people flying, send things flying, not people flying, send things flying into people. And uh, yeah, let's just say it's, it's very scary actually. <laughs> So uh, I always cringe when I see claims of inherent safety just because it's not it's safe. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask Rob a quick question. Yeah, go for it. People wearing gloves in your videos, are, is that protecting the robot from the person or the person from, like when you the, the self-healing materials? <laughs> why, I was just wondering, why are there people wearing gloves? And I you know, wonder, is that a safety issue for the person or a safety issue for the robot? <laughs> uh, whenever you're wearing... Uh... <laughs> So gloves in a, in a chem chemistry lab are actually for protecting the samples from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Megan, <laughs> 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 yeah. I touch on that from a yeah. safety question. No, it's a great question. question. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's all I want to say. Uh, excellent. Uh, well, I think uh, in the, the interest of, of time, I will ask one more quick question. And then if there are other questions from the audience, uh, I, I would welcome those as well. Um, so uh, what I want to ask is I think as I was watching all of your talks, this sort of came up where, uh, to varying degrees, you use materials or you use structures to create your interesting compliance or your usable compliance. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, in, in your opinions, maybe uh, if you want to argue one way or the other or just give your thoughts on it, which of these should we uh, uh, expect to get the most use out of uh, in the future? Uh, which should we be aiming to really push for? The, the structural analysis or the materials analysis? Uh, obviously, I think we should do both, sure. uh, but <laughs> I, I do think, I mean, for me, and this is maybe just my, my bias and my background, like, I just really love an elegant structure, right? And maybe this also pushes back on Rob's idea of complexity, like, if it can just be simple and elegant, like a steerable needle that gives you six degrees of freedom from two actuators, oh, like, yeah. I love that. But uh, I also, you know, an inverted robot that, you know, looks like it can do all these things with this very simple, low dimensional actuation scheme. But at the same time, I, I understand that to get these structures that are seemingly very simple and elegant to work in real world applications, you have to start wrapping complexity around it kind of externally. And so if the material function can then prevent having to add those layers of kind of add on complexity, which is I think what often happens in the systems in my lab, they start out like really pretty and clean. And then as we continue developing, it just gets kind of nastier and nastier as we, as this <laughs> complexity has to get added externally. And, and maybe it could wind up being more elegant in the end if we use functional materials instead to, in order to get that complexity. So we start from a structure and then we want to functionalize the material the structure is made of. Right. In some way. Yeah. But that's that's maybe not the right way to go. Instead, okay. maybe we should maybe we have go some other, other thoughts from the rest of the panel on, on where we should be headed. I think this is a brilliant question. Um, to me, I think when we talk about compliance, uh, compliance, it's a uh, soft material already gave us the property, which is really soft, right? Well, very low uh, modulus. But uh, well, but really, what is really important, I think, the structural design gives us uh, as capability to actually manipulate the stiffness distribution. Um, this is why that we recently got into this uh, origami robot combined with smart material. Physically, we have the functional material actuating the structure. So that, that's the reason I think it's really important. For example, I just, um, one example I want to show um, is that how we developed this uh, small crawler that is made of origami structure. Physically, it provides us uh, with this anisotropic stiffness, the whole thing is still compliant, right? It can move, it can contract, but uh, so it, it's soft in the actual, uh, in the direction that it needs to be soft. And it's very stiff in the direction that it needs to be stiff to overcome the um, external um, resistance from the uh, environment. So these are the things that uh, only using 
soft material cannot give us. Um, so that's the reason I think uh, soft material is definitely interesting, but uh, um, combining this uh, soft materials with rationally designed structures would give us more um, possibilities and open up a lot of interesting topics and uh, potential. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that gives me a nice flag to just say I agree with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, I, and maybe something that I, uh, I can add on top of that is um, maybe, uh, obviously, I think both, we have to pursue both materials and structures, sure. but, and there are groups that are doing different things that can, you know, contribute to both fields, but I do think I'm in love with structures too as a mechanical engineer, but I think so far we've seen examples of um, a variety of different robots, rigid robots built out of rigid materials. For us, as part of the soft robotics community, we want to, you know, push forward. And so if we only can achieve certain levels of complexity in terms of structures with the rigid components, yes, we have to pursue soft materials. And we have to pursue soft materials that can provide uh, structural capabilities and functional capabilities at the same time. So for example, um, I've worked in the past on um, uh, injecting materials that can be, for example, cured inside soft microfluidic channels and then solidified in specific locations. So to provide functional and structural capabilities at the same time. And so, yes, I, I echo what Renee was saying, um, you know, pursuing those capabilities within the materials themselves. And I believe soft materials give you nice opportunities in terms of that. Uh, the, what I would, so the functional requirements should define what we, we can. Sure. In the case of, um, in the case of uh, uh, resonance or uh, energy efficiency, uh, rubbers are a bad idea in that there's uh, a highly elastic and component to it, but also a highly dissipative, dissipative component. So if we can get the same thing from a ceramic structure, we should do that. The problem is it's very hard to get um, ceramic structures um, that are highly confined without breaking, making them thinner and thinner, and eventually do get there. But the cost or the complexity of making them might be outside the scope of the project. Metals are um, a better choice in terms of like the compromise between the two. Um, I think, um, anyway, so it, but the simplicity you get from, I'm arguing about simplicity. simplicity. Sure. <laughs> uh, you, don't, you, you don't need the rational design as much if you're using, if you're printing a rubber, you can just know it's going to be soft. Yeah. There's like intrinsic compliance uh, from that. Um, so, depending on where you are on the scale, of, if you need something that's uh, very energy efficient and can store it, at least most of the energy that's built into it, then um, if you do need that, then you should go with some kind of uh, plastic, metal, or even better ceramic um, that can do that. And if you don't, then it's easier just to go with the, the rubber. I think that's a, a, a very interesting uh, kind of point uh, to hear, especially from someone who works so much in materials, uh, uh, but I, I, I think it's well taken. Um, I think we've got just a little bit of time. If there are any questions that we have for the from the audience, now that we've got our uh, speakers here uh, 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 ready to answer them, maybe we'll take one or two uh, in the interest of their time as well. Um, uh, actually, I have one question. Sure. Uh, so, so, so thinking about soft robots, uh, there are many types of like actuators or materials or power sources that use. For example, pneumatic, uh, like the electric, uh, the electric homer, uh, like like SMA, mm -hmm. piezoelectric, uh, <laughs> like magnet, like like yeah. like magnetic yeah. ones. Uh, <laughs> yeah, even combustion based. Uh, many of the like in the future, <laughs> looking at the future, like which one, or you know, how does this look like? Right, so many, so sure. many, many kinds of actors. Like, uh, is there anyone that will win, or they are will be kicking at the <laughs> same tire? Like, like how does the future will like how does the future will look like? Sure. Um, so uh, for anyone, I don't know if the amplification was working well from that mic. 
Uh, but the question was essentially uh, with the various different uh, uh, actuators we have right now for soft robotics, some of which you might put more in the structural or this material category, uh, to go back to the previous question, uh, how do we kind of figure out which ones of those are going to win out? Uh, or is there a good way to figure out uh, how, you know, how we judge those relative to each other? Um, I guess I'll answer a second. Sure. <laughs> um, well, that's a really good question, but I, I don't personally think that there is one actuation methodology that will win. I think robotics is, it's a really wide field and is still, it, ha, it's fun, it has a lot of foundational science within it, but at the end of the day, it's an applied field. It's an applied science. And so in my opinion, whatever makes sense will work, you know, for, for applications that require, I don't know, higher power, higher, higher density and, and things like that. Some specific actuators might be more appropriate and then it's worth investigating those. And I wouldn't like say, well, you know, let's focus on one specific sure. yeah. king or thing <laughs> type of um, actuation methodology. It's really, we have to, as roboticists, I think we have to consider what are we doing this for? What is the type of problem that we want to solve? And Going back to the thing that Rob mentioned earlier of uh, you know, we have to figure out the, the metrics or the application maybe and what, what matters for that application. Uh, I think that's been brought up uh, for quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. I'm <laughs> satisfied. <laughs> uh, do we have another, one more question? Yeah, sure. No, someone else. <laughs> Let's wait and see what yes. you yeah. uh, I don't know if that mic's just on. Project. Just, if you just want to project, I can also repeat afterwards. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you guys for the discussion. I think it was very insightful. Um, I think part of the reason why this workshop was really, really interesting for me to come to is in terms of trying to bridge the gap between some of the really cool techniques that are on both sides of the aisle and bring them together. I wondered though how you guys from your positions as like educators and professors think about um, elderly exposure to, to students on both sides in terms of like being able to get access to the cool technologies and be maps I have to offer like you have to offer in terms of like sorts of inspiring people to having some cool ideas at a younger stage um, in terms of the curriculum from that standpoint. Great, a, a fantastic question. I think it relates to something that was said early on in the discussion. So to, to kind of summarize and repeat it, uh, as educators, how do you think about uh, imbuing your students with the the uh, capabilities from maybe both sides of this, uh, this uh, uh, connection here? Uh, in order to give them the most creativity for uh, when they're making their soft robots. Um, whoever wants to answer. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I can have a quick answer to this one. It depends on what, what level the students are, we're talking about. For example, if the, we're looking at uh, just try to um, spread the soft robotic concept to a a lot of students, like including undergrads, master students, and then I would think about like bio inspiration, just to get the students very excited about the world of soft robotics. But talking about PhD students, then there will be a whole different story. <laughs> Sorry, Alison, what, 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 what? Actually, well, I'm just sort of curious, Renee, because you taught a soft robotics materials class, and I think some robotics students took it. Uh, like people with a robotics background, I was curious how they adapted to the materials concepts. And it's okay if the answer was that like it was really difficult for them. <laughs> I'm just curious. This is a very good question. I think for, yeah, in my class, I, I did have a very mixed background of students. Um, so for the students uh, from, for example, electrical engineering, they are actually, they didn't know about all those different uh, types of uh, soft functional materials and to them it's like opening up a, a, well, a new world and they can think about these materials and they now know these materials are available and they to combine with very complex uh, actuation system to achieve something more interesting. If I can add just one other sure. it's, a, it's a really nice question because I, I want to just share my experience and the enthusiasm that I've gotten from my students. So I teach this um, medical robotics class at BU. It's a graduate course. And uh, I've been developing a bunch of labs, like seven, eight labs, using soft robot, uh, soft materials and soft robotics within that uh, course because it's so 
much more accessible, especially during the pandemic. I had to put together kits and ship them to the students at home. And I had to think about, oh my gosh, what am I going to be putting in these kits? Mm -hmm. You know, so soft robotics um, gives you the opportunity of putting together a kit for, I don't know, $100, $120 and ship that to the students and together we've built, you know, wearable robots that could be used for rehabilitation, for haptics. Uh, I, I've, I've shipped them, you know, soft elastomers that they could use uh, and pour and uh, fabricate those soft robotic tiny systems. So the enthusiasm that I got from them, especially during a time like the pandemic, that they were doing this at home in their room alone, it was incredible. So I think, you know, I would have, I never got that uh, opportunity as a student. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm you know, just enjoying their enthusiasm at this point on the other side of the table. And I think that's great. So it's definitely something that we all should be thinking about pushing and moving forward in the community as educators. Well, fantastic answers all around. Uh, I don't know if there are any other people who want to answer that question. Well, with that, uh, I would like to uh, invite us all to thank the panelists uh, for all the time. <laughs> showing up and for staying past five o'clock and thank the uh the organizers of the debate um and i don't know if they have something else to say but uh we'll go ahead and let them close out yes i um, want to quickly grab the mic in order to thank three groups of people um the first group of people are of course the presenters who agreed to be here in person and also stay up um online um, without their contribution and without the contribution of the people who had the teaser presentations and posters, this would have not been the workshop that it is. And I thank also Laura Blumenschein for agreeing to do the soft robotic debate in person, because usually it is online, as you might know. So uh, please join me in a big applause for um, all of them. second group of people are the people actually who organized the workshop and now they are <laughs> gone but I of course remember them and um, first of all um, Annika Ratz and her team from the University of Hannover and um, Jan Peters who pulled everything together and um, always in the background inviting people etc. Oliver Brock um, who has long experience in organizing workshop actually framed workshops um, over the years and for his guidance in making this a successful workshop. Then we have Rene Zhao, who <laughs> agreed to do this with um, a set of roboticists as a material <laughs> scientist. Um, and then Professor um, uh, Zuzu Mori, <laughs> sorry for the pronunciation, who stayed up also uh, very late and agreed to have the um, introductionary talk um, um, at this um, workshop and um, I think I thank all of them so um, please join me in thanking um, everyone.